any sort of points of clarification, so not big complicated questions, just any, any things you didn't quite get or anything like that. So then that gives us plenty of time. Well, I'll ask them to join me here at the top, and we'll have plenty of time for a, a general Q&A so that everyone gets a, a fair crack of the whip. Um, so that's okay with everyone? Good. Um, so without any further ado, um, can I ask Donald yeah. to um, get us started? I think this session is probably one of the most important of the whole two days, actually, because I think we can all agree the technology is not the issue. We all know what to do. It's, what's the business model? How do you pay for it? Anyway, okay, over to you, Donald. Okay. Uh, so, am I lined up to go next? No? I've got to come out of here. Sorry, I was in my that. <coughs> we'll just uh, <laughs> allow the technology to sort itself out. I think it's coming. Yay, there we go. Okay, uh, hello everyone. I'm Donald. Uh, I'm at the University of Leeds. I was at the University of Sussex until about uh, six months or so ago. Um, today I'm going to talk to you about whole house retrofit uh, and the Energy Sprong initiative. Now, a little show of hands. How many people have heard of the Energy Sprong initiative? Great, everyone. So if I'm talking complete garbledy gook, uh, you'll at least sort of have some frame of reference. Um, so, yeah, so... I think you know, this audience is probably very aware of the lack of progress in recent years on uh, the decarbonisation of buildings. Um, you know, since 2012 and the big supplier obligations ended, we've really made very little progress at all. Uh, that is express, uh, especially true in, built in, in homes. Um, obviously, you know, with all the associated uh, benefits to residents of uh, energy efficiency going well beyond just, just carbon reduction. Um, a key argument I want to make here, and I think it's one that is, is more widely recognised, is that a whole house approach to retrofit is really now what is necessary um, to meet our carbon target targets, but also actually to deliver on those other objectives, um, improving people's uh, quality of life, improving kind of uh, comfort and well-being in homes. And I think uh, that strategy really relies on treating the building as a system. It involves multiple complementary measures uh, thought about together. Uh, thinking about how they interact, um, and factors in wider things like moisture and air quality, thermal bridging, not just uh, CO2 emissions. And I think that's been a real failing of uh, the approach up until now, as it's been too narrowly focused on carbon. Obviously, carbon is important, but we need to think about how buildings actually perform in the real world, and that needs to be baked into whatever we're doing uh, to them, and obviously requiring a, a well-trained supply chain. So... Effectively, what I'm depicting here is kind of the traditional business model of how we've delivered um, retrofit. It typified the approach for the Green Deal and the supplier obligations, tending to be single measures delivered by separate subcontractors, um, you know, whether that's windows, insulation, uh, solar hot water, the energy audit. Um, and that really, for a whole house retrofit, a multi-measure retrofit, is really quite a complex project management exercise for the household. You know, having to manage multiple different interfaces with different contractors, source the finance, uh, you know, not, not an easy task. Um, obviously, there are now, uh, at the present, no real guarantees on performance. It tends to be kind of a fit and forget approach, and you're obviously getting uh, a large performance gap um, in many retrofits that have been undertaken historically. Again, that kind of narrow focus on CO2, um, often producing uh, unintended consequences, so damp, mould... Uh, those kinds of issues that, you know, if you're not thinking about the building in a systemic way, you're not thinking about ventilation, you're just sticking a single measure in, uh, often creates these kind of problems. So in my interviews, uh, you know, many people describing this as a really siloed approach and very piecemeal, um, really not going to get us where we need to go. So energy sprung, uh, you know, you'll all have seen, um, perhaps in The Guardian and elsewhere, you know, the images of Nottingham. Um, this row of social housing... Um, Interestingly, obviously, one house was left out, and I think people in the project called this the, the missing tooth in the smile of the, of the street. But, you know, the, you, you'd be aware of the principles. It's an off-site manufactured approach, you know, using kind of industrialization and automation um, to really kind of drive uh, efficiency in the process. So the business model of Energy Sprong is basically a, an energy service agreement, which people may be familiar with from the world of ESCOs. Um, it's based on a 30-year performance guarantee for net zero energy, and that actually consists of a guarantee of 21 degrees 
uh, of internal temperature and also a flat rate uh, for heating, for hot water, and actually a kind of ceiling on your uh, electricity consumption. Um, often the analogy that is used is a mobile phone contract with usage limits, where provided you don't use more than uh, you're contracted to, you pay the same amount. The other side of the business model is obviously this industrialised supply chain, you know, trying to move to an off-site manufactured approach, um, a, a performance contract, uh, actually in the Energy Spawn case it's tied into the rental agreement, um, so you pay one payment for your services and rent, uh, which is fixed, um, and actually the, the ESCO in this case um, contracts upstream with the energy utility to kind of deliver a, a total energy management package. Um, so really the emphasis here is, is, is away from um, uh, CO2 and kind of cost savings and much more to do with comfort, uh, aesthetics, improving the kind of look and feel of the property, potentially increasing value, not cost savings. And I think that's a big misnomer that we've had for a long time in retrofit. It needs to not be about saving money. It needs to be about improving uh, people's homes and their buildings and, and what they like to be in. Obviously, that single interface um, kind of creates a, a rather much more simple uh, journey for the customer. Um, having to kind of sign one contract and hopefully it's happening uh, relatively rapidly. So <clears throat> I think a key, uh, another key thing to emphasise here, and it probably uh, deserves to be in here, it's the title of the presentation, is that um, Energy Sprong, the market development team who are promoting Energy Sprong, are not an ESCO and they do not deliver the retrofit. Effectively, they are acting as an intermediary uh, to secure different aspects uh, of change in the market. So that's obviously... Um, facilitating a kind of interaction between industry stakeholders, uh, social landlords, the supply chain, government, um, particularly in the case of the Netherlands where it emerged, you know, configuring the new business model, what's possible, what does the supply chain need to do, how's the contract going to work for a, uh, an energy performance contract, and then actually also kind of upstream brokering, uh, securing policy changes, raising resources. So in the Netherlands, um, they actually changed the law to allow uh, energy... Uh, service contracts to be loaded into rent because it was previously illegal. Um, obviously, the UK team are going after various bits of money, uh, EU funding. Uh, there was also a change to mortgage um, law in the Netherlands to allow uh, green mortgages, which is potentially a route for the private sector. However, um, right now, energy sprung is just too expensive. So, you know, th that kind of figure of perhaps £85,000 or something is the current cost. Now, Advocates of Energy Sprong argue that, you know, with a sufficient pipeline, uh, once the supply chain can gear up, that we can actually move down the cost curve towards something that is a self-sustaining business model. Um, you know, that is going to require a large order volume, and I know that the team at Energy Sprong are trying to go after about 150 million quid of uh, kind of, well, they call it seed corn funding, it's a pretty big seed corn, um, you know, to, to try and drive that innovation journey. And so that learning rate is really only partially demonstrated, although there is some... Uh, promising signs from the Netherlands um, with, with increasing volume. Um, so yes, tended to be in the social housing sector, much more difficult in private rented because obviously with social housing you can negotiate um, large order volumes, uh, you know, and have kind of fewer conversations. So the only owner-occupier market being much more difficult. So how am I doing for time? Okay. So really kind of just, just abstracting away from energy sprung slightly, um, you know, the, the key things I want to say really is that a whole house retrofit is going to be necessary. That approach is going to be necessary for us to meet our climate change targets and also actually do good uh, in people's homes. Uh, that traditional business model, the atomized market model that I, we call it, uh, really is inappropriate for delivering this goal. So that single measures, sort of subcontractors doing separate things is not really going to work uh, in this context. So uh, excuse the, uh, the business model jargon, but... Um, Hopefully these terms are self-explanatory. So really the value proposition uh, needs to focus on performance guarantees and wider renovation value. So comfort, property improvement, aesthetics, and not cost savings actually is the key thing that you're trying to sell to people. Um, integrated supply chains and process innovation, so off-site manufacture, rapid installs, energy, energy sprung in the Netherlands getting down to a day uh, in some cases for the retrofit. Uh, obviously that single uh, customer interface, one point of contact, throughout the project, not multiple people that the resident has to speak to, um, you know, simplifying the customer journey. Um, a financial model based on a, an integrated financing mechanism, so a self-sustaining financing mechanism and linked to the performance outcomes. Uh, I know in the, in the Energy Spawn case, that seems to be that they will use um, 
local authority budgets or housing association budgets. Again, if it's a private sector offering, it needs to have some kind of financing mechanism attached to it. Um, and sort of finally, that really looking at the energy sprong study as a, as a case study, um, the role of the intermediary here is really critical, and they're often needed to facilitate uh, changes in industry, in policy, in financing. Um, and I think it was successful in the Netherlands um, due to these strong links it had with government. It was actually funded by a 50 million euro grant uh, by the government, and they had a strong voice in the room with government to change regulations and kind of push the thing along on its journey. So that really, I don't want to sort of stand here and say we don't need policy. Business models are not a replacement for good policy. They are a, a supplement to them. So, you know, minimum EPC, EPC targets, uh, a low-cost financing offering to kind of learn the lessons of the Green Deal, support for intermediaries, uh, and also kind of training. So that's, yeah, I think that's kind of uh, our message from, from this research. So, yeah, thanks very much. points of clarification on that. There'll be plenty of time for more detailed questions. Colin? Yes. Yep. yep. Um, to the age of the houses, are we talking about like 60, 70? It feels like a very narrow frame houses or what are like, like narrow periods houses were built. Um, they say not. I mean, I, I, I've sort of turned into a quasi-advocate of energy sprung, although I think there are some limitations to what it can do. Arguably, they say that any building, because they use... Um, a 3D scanner, any building can in theory be prefabricated to be retrofitted in that way. Obviously, the more complex the facade, the harder that is to do. Um, but there is no, there is no kind of arbitrary, um, you know, building archetype, if you like, that, that it works for. I think that it, it's easier in blocks, terraces, you know, with simple build forms and stuff. But there's nothing in principle that prevents you from doing it just to, to uh, even a Victorian terrace, but then, you know, the Heritage Brigade will tell you that that's not, um, not okay. But, yeah, in principle, no. Okay. Yep. I just wondered if you're familiar with the work of carbon co-op in Greater Manchester. I am, yes. So, uh, yeah, of course, it's, you know, it takes a lot of the, uh, the points that you're making here, but it, obviously it's different to energy sprout, you know, it's much more bespoke mm -hmm. kind of approach, but, you know, it's had not a significant success. Yeah. You know, yeah, yeah, I, I, sat, I went up to Manchester a few times and said, I'm really impressed by what those guys are doing. And that kind of community engagement side, is, which is so important for retrofit, you have to bring people with you. It cannot be done to them. Um, yeah, I, I think it's a horses for courses thing. I don't think energy sprung is the answer for, for everyone and everything. I think certainly social housing, it, it really seems to make a lot of sense. But yeah, bespoke things definitely have a role, I think. Last, last, last one, we'll, we'll, we'll pick yours up later. Yeah. The energy performance guarantee is quite hard to implement because, yep. as you said, performance gap is pretty dominant. So if there was a performance gap, how would energy strong differentiate whether that was because of occupant behavior mm. or because of fabric or systems? It's a good question. I think... So if you imagine kind of the way that ESCOs operate, that that is, that is something that is, is, is a contract that they are on the hook for for a certain period. I think in terms of... So, you know, they, they know what they're buying into and the, the solution provider, they call it, knows what they're buying into when they're, when they're um, doing the work. I think on the, on the behaviour versus building performance side, um, I think the idea is that you have this, um, that they, they are trying to do various bits of sort of monitoring to understand what's going on, window opening and stuff like that. But I think the idea of the flat, you know, you, you can consume X amount and if you consume above that, then you pay. But there is an assumption that, you know, an average family or whatever will be consuming X, and as long as you're below that, you're, you're, you're paying the same. Okay. But it's not foolproof. I think in time will tell whether that works. Like Thank that. you very much. Yep. Done. Yep. Okay. have time for more questions later. If I could ask Sarah. Should I sit here? Yeah, you, you, well, unless, unless you want to crane your neck, you can sit down there. Sit down there. Um, off the stage. <laughs> <laughs> so... Sarrow is going to be talking to us about business models for the displacement of oil by heat pumps and energy storage in social housing, and I think using Northern Ireland as a bit of a case study.
It's an encouraging noise. It was not Try just pressing escape could be. And go back into slideshow. Just while we're waiting, um, there was a guy over there who had one question for Donald. Do you want to do that? Just while we're waiting. <laughs> How long the retrofit takes. Yeah. Um, so I think, so in the Netherlands they start out with I think a week. I think they'll get it down to 24 hours. Mm -hmm. this in, in the Nottingham yeah. example, this is part of the problem in Britain, we, we tend not to like to learn from our group of neighbours. I think they kind of have to go back and, and actually it did take quite a long time. So David Adams from Maybe It's Home, he's the guy that we um, I think part of the thing is on the site, the off site no. supply chain is really the best. But the aim is to get certainly under a week, you know, kind of just a real and a big cruise of people coming in, not no loads, more than changing rooms. Yeah. <laughs> the idea is that they don't. I think that's what they're aiming for. You know, I, I'm, how how realisable that is? But I think it's certainly trying to reduce that amount of time that you know the whole thing is happening. Making it into a reality TV show actually yeah. might. might yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> Help to fund. Help to fund it. Happy last night, Shulam. Show the slides. Up now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. We just go to. Yeah. 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 Thank you very much. <laughs> okay, over to you, Sarah. I'll start your time now, don't worry. <laughs> so, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Osaru. I'm a PhD student at Ostar University. Um, my research is uh, under SPIRE 2. SPIRE 2 is an acronym for Storage Platform for the Integration of Renewable Energy. It's a £6 million EU funded research um, set up to address how consumer owned energy storage can address the issue of renewable energy intermittency. This afternoon, I will be presenting a business model for the displacement of oil by heat pump and energy storage in social housing. First, I would like to start by pointing out a link between oil prices and food poverty. In 2011, when oil prices were at 54 pence per litre, food poverty in Northern Ireland was at 42 percent. While in 2016, when oil prices dropped to about 24 pence per litre, for poverty in Northern Ireland was at 22 percent. Oil is an unregulated foil and is a major contributor to CO2 emissions. Unfortunately, 68 percent of homes in Northern Ireland still use oil heaters. 82 percent of these are in rural areas disconnected from the gas grid. There's now a new ban from connecting new homes to gas heating by 2025. So we need to decarbonize heat 
And as we do this, we need to consider the vulnerable part of our population, which are mostly those tenants and those in social housing. We need business models that could provide low-cost renewable eating solutions and reduce for poverty levels. The business model we are presenting is of two parts. First, it's a dynamic tariff based on excess wind. So Northern Ireland is set to achieve 40% renewable by 2020. We already hit 38% in 2018. And there's a lot of curtainment of wind. In 2017, about 386 gigawatts of wind was curtailed in all other markets. We have a DS3 market, which is TSO controlled, and it's set up to accommodate up to 75% non synchronous penetration on the grid. The estimated expenditure for this DSC market in 2016, the budget was about 60 million pounds. If some of this excess wind were to be managed by the consumers, this would reduce the need for the DSC market and save the consumers some pounds. The second part of the business model is it as a service, and we are proposing this as a kind of motivation for landlords to invest in local carbon technologies. The high capital costs for replacing oil heaters with heat pump is a major turn off for landlords because the benefit associated with this, which is maybe savings in electricity bills and improved heating service, are felt alone by the tenants. We need business models that would allow tenants to add electricity bills to their rents. So, taking the case study in Coloring, Northern Ireland have a social housing estate by Sally Estates with about 217 dwellings. This estate is connected to the Lokestown substation. The Lokestown substation is currently facing some constraints. An enterprise zone was set up just beside us Investing University in Coloring in 2017. And this enterprise zone has a data, data center that has eaten out of the capacity. Data centers have huge demand. And now there's weeks of not being able to connect future consumers of similar size. It is estimated that it will take about 11 million pounds to upgrade this network. Another part of this work is to investigate what consumer flexibility can do to reduce some of these constraints and help for network deferral or network upgrade deferral. If you look at this network, it's also a lot of excess wind. This is the load profile for Lockstown substation. At the bottom there, you see some negative load, which represents excess wind or excess generation. If you flip this load profile, you find out that at some times, this excess wind gets up to one megawatt. This could be used to provide low carbon heating. So some of the questions we're asking is, how do we make best use of these renewables to provide low carbon heating? and reduce some of the constraints and weak containments. Another question is, can behind the meter generation and storage help to flatten the load profile? And if so, can this help to reduce some of the constraints and the lockdown substation? How do we value the consumer flexibility? And how do we reward those that are providing it? Apart from doing the business model, we are also looking at the technical parts. So we are looking at the effect of decarbonization on the low voltage grid. And we are doing this using a new plan software. This new plan software is used for load flow analysis. Inside the business model, there are different inputs, such as consumer load profiles, solar panel profiles, um, heat pump profiles, and different battery models or storage models. And we are looking at different scenarios. So we are considering replacing with um, pure SOS heat pump, replacing with hybrid exhaust pump running with economy seven tariff. We are looking at hybrid exhaust pump using the excess wind the network. And in these different scenarios, we are considering different penetration of heat pump replacement. So from 0% up to 100% penetration. And from there, we are calculating the CO2 saved from this, the capital cost, the operational cost, the rate of return and the payback period. Here's the technical model of this on NIPLAN software. And that thing I would like to state is that NIPLAN is currently used by NIN networks. NIN networks are a system operators for Northern Ireland, so it allows our research to feed directly into their work. 
So we took one of these um, penetration, 60% seed pump penetration, and simulated it with different scenarios. Heat pump with economy seven tariff, heat pump with, uh, with hybrid wind, heat pump with solar panels. So we also proposed installing solar panels on all the south facilities within the community. And then we consider a last scenario which combines heat pump, solar panels, and the excess wind in the network. All of these different scenarios showed savings in consumer electricity bill. However, they were not enough to offset the high capital cost. However, with the ROHI incentive, which currently is suspended in Northern Ireland, the last scenario showed about £59 per year saving for an average consumer. Each of these scenarios also showed savings in CO2 emissions. For that works. We are currently investigating um, how to shift consumer load demand, heat demand, to the types of excess wind using thermal storage, so buffer tanks. We are also considering how consumer-owned flexibility can be monetized. Currently, there is no scheme for it to be, to be monetized. The role of government <coughs> is to create schemes where this kind of value could be monetized. The RHI scheme, the Renewable Incentive Scheme, which has been the major driver for the carbonization of heat. The RHI scheme is set up to support these technologies until a time when they are matured enough to stand on their own. However, what we notice is that when these RHI schemes are suspended, installations permit. We need more structured approach, such as allowing tenants, uh, landlords to add electricity bills to their, to their rents. I would like to end by stating that Northern Ireland is a perfect test bed for consumer owned flexibility. A lot of our wind resource is located in the distribution part of the network. So for those who are looking to research on consumer owned flexibility, I'm inviting you to Northern Ireland. We need our own project, low carbon coloring, and not project Leo. I would like to thank SUPB for funding this research, and also thank um, Dr. Ina Voshayo, who is in the audience, for her immense contribution to the research. She's been, she would have loved to say one or two things, but with time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. I'm sure any scheme that was an alternative to the RHI is probably very politically attractive in Northern Ireland, given the trouble they got into over it. Anyway, uh, any more points of clarification from that? Yep, two up there. Uh, first, first, yep, you. Oh, thanks Blue so chat. much, um, Chief Bell from the University of Strathclyde. Could you go back to the cost-benefit analysis slide, please? I'll just try to unpack it's a lot of clarification, but the kind of the highlight messages there I wasn't quite clear on. And you, you come there, all of them have got a negative cost-benefit, so apparently, is that what you're saying? They're all, all of those are more expensive than the existing... So without average, I, all of the whole show savings in consumer electricity bills. However, the capital cost of installing a heat pump is not enough for the. How many years have you been doing that evaluation? Because you know it's a high capital cost, but then lower operating costs over. For 25 years. 25 years. Five years. 25. 25. 25. 25. Right. Yeah. Right. Okay. Bottom one is right. The bottom one is positive. Yeah. So with average high, um, the last uh, scenario shows a savings of 59 pounds. Okay, um, no, we just considered heat pump. And the reason is because of their ease of, of replacement. So a typical home having an oil boiler, it's easy for you to like move the oil boiler and put heat pump. And maybe if they have a buffer tank, we could make use of that buffer tank for energy storage. So it's much easier for you to retrofit with heat pump. Okay, um, let, well, can we save yours? Or is it a really quick one? <coughs> quick one. Better be. <laughs> For the low temperature, low slow temperature with a high temperature heat pumps. Mm -hmm. For the low temperature or high temperature heat pumps. Yeah, so these are low temperature heat pumps. Um, 
and we have one with um, a COP of about 2.5. So I didn't get that. Um, is it including the, the cost for retrofitting the uh, distribution system? So the radiators, pipe work, and so on? No, no, no. no, no, no. Cost. So, so usually, the, for uh, a normal oil heating, we'd be using maybe for the radiators, would be about 60 degree temperature. But for heat pumps, uh, you need maybe something a little lower. But we didn't, we didn't factor that in into the calculation. So, so the cost are included in there for that? No, no. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Sarah. Uh -huh. If I could ask um, Carly and Tim, possibly our technician. <laughs> <laughs> it worked. We did this earlier and it worked. So let's see whether it still does. Come on. All right. Mm. It's different. Great. Hey, how about that? I'm not ready now. Huh? Good. <laughs> oh, I killed it now. I think this will take just takes time. No, no, it just takes time. Okay. Great. One of your many talents, Tim. Uh, okay, so I'm Carla McLaughlin. This is Tim brownholt Spate. Um, I'm going to talk about the Financing Community Energy Project, which is part of UKIRC. And I'm just going to talk a little bit about the framing of the project before handing over to Tim. Um, so the project is part of UKIRC's Theme 3 in Phase 3, which is Energy Systems at Multiple Scales. And we responded to a specific call around community energy finance for the project, which was seen as a, a, a gap in the academic literature in this area. Um, the project ends this month, although some of our outputs might come slightly later than that. Um, and we had a UK-wide focus. So we were a, a collaboration between Manchester, Strathclyde and Imperial. And actually, we have a full house of everybody uh, in the project at the conference. So um, hopefully you'll catch up with some of, some of them in other sessions and there will be some other parts of the work presented too. So just to give you a sense of, of the project overall, um, in the first work package we looked at the evolution of the sector, so how have we got to where we are now so that we can kind of think more about where we might go next, and our report on that is available on Newkirk's website. In the second work package uh, we ran a survey uh, where we tried to collect detailed information about financial performance and business models of specific community energy projects, um, and there'll be a presentation on that later in the conference. In Work Package 3, we looked at specific case studies, so looking at the financial and project performance, but in that, that more detailed case-specific work, as well as some sectoral-level interviews there. That will also be presented at a later session. Um, and then what we're going to talk about more right now is around the synthesis, engagement, and building of pathways um, to think about the future of the sector. So how do we go about that? Well, there were some questions in the survey about what participants were planning to do next, what community groups were planning to do next. As part of the Mayor's Green Summit in Manchester, um, we, with the Coalesce EU project and Quantum Strategy, ran um, a, what was called a listening exercise on community energy to generate pathways and visions, but also to generate a big list of asks for Andy Burnham, the Mayor, uh, to support community energy locally. And we combined insight from, from those two sources with a review of the literature on business models, future business models for community energy. And then we took those uh, to workshops in Edinburgh, London and Card Cardiff with sector um, representatives. So to give you a sense of sort of what, what respondents got, what participants got for that, uh, for that workshop, we set the framing as being about a long-term vision. So there's quite a lot of work in the sector at the moment about kind of how to survive and how to get beyond the fits end and things like that. And we felt like other, as has already been mentioned today, perhaps other actors were better placed to respond to that dynamically in a, in a timely fashion. And perhaps we could do something that was looking a little bit longer term. Um, and we used these business models, which Tim will talk about more, as kind of building blocks for the sector and things for, for respondents to, um, to give a view on and to kind of respond to. Those business models are about projects, they're not about whole organisations. So one organisation might operate multiple business models. And what we did um, is we specified elements of, uh, of energy, of the energy activity that was going on in that business model, but we left some elements particularly uh, on purpose open. So around the structure, around the financial aspects and around what made the community difference. Um, and then we facilitated respondents, uh, participants through... Um, 
a, a kind of backcasting exercise. So thinking about how that could work in a longer term vision and then thinking about the actions that were needed to get us uh, from today to that condition. Uh, and so Tim will talk a bit more about that. Uh, yes, thanks, Carly. So this is a kind of a quick summary of the business model outlines that we, we based our workshop discussions on. Uh, to run through them quickly, Renewable Electricity Federation. So this is lots of community electricity generators around the UK, locally owned and run still, but they could be cooperating to sell electricity in bulk to get a better deal for it. Energy saving services, we said was about energy efficiency works, retrofit and so on, as we've heard about. There are some community district heat networks already, a few of them, so we suggested for these discussions there could be more in the future. EV charging, uh, we wondered whether there would be community groups installing and operating electric vehicle charging networks, perhaps selling their own electricity too. And the last one, the, the smart energy local aggregator, is the idea of community groups helping people to manage demand-side response at a kind of neighbourhood level. So an aggregator bridging between the wider energy system and market and individual householders. So that's a quick summary. We, we sent this out to our participants in more detail. We went through it with them. Uh, now, the next few slides show our kind of initial analysis of what people said. Um, we've kind of gone across the different business models to try and look for some common themes and different workshops. But yeah, this is not necessarily stuff that everybody there agrees with. So anyway, the vision to start with, there we are. We're in the long term. We're 2050 or wherever. And community energy is everywhere. Um, there's local organisations locally rooted but cooperating with each other across the country and engaged in many parts of the energy system. So generating energy, selling it locally, um, kind of combining these different business, block, business model building blocks and stacking revenues to make sure everyone gets a fair deal from the kind of smart, decentralised, flexible energy system of the future. <laughs> they can do this because there are local energy markets everywhere uh, still with a national grid as a backup, though, and renewables have become the cheapest means of generating electricity. Buying local energy has become a normal thing to do. The population is more energy literate, and houses are energy efficient and retrofit is all done. So in the future, we've got there. Um, so transport is electrified, finally, and community organisations saw themselves as being part of a more collective approach, so car clubs or locally managed bus services and so on, and this powered by renewables too, of course. So this sounds fantastic. How do we get there and who does what? Well, as others have said, firstly our participants felt that central government has a key role to play. Uh, taking climate change seriously for a start and setting zero carbon targets for, for everyone, for all sectors. But in the detail of the energy transition, making sure that there's space for smaller actors. So they were keen to see regulation to encourage local supply and to keep kind of the data systems open source and generally to kind of stop Google and Amazon buying the energy system of the future before anyone else gets a look in. Thirdly, Talking about co-benefits, as the, we've heard a lot about the, the social and local economic value of local energy this morning. And um, this again came up very strongly in our workshops. People are very keen that government should recognise the, the benefits that community-owned and run energy brings to other policy areas. Um, and to allow regulators to look beyond just keeping the system on and keeping it cheap. Um, it's an appeal for, I guess, what was once called joined-up government and joined up regulations to allow Ofgem and people to do that. <coughs> and finally, how do we get that retrofit done? People felt there needed to be grant funding for this, that there just isn't a viable business model for getting the people who need it most to be able to pay for it. So it's a public good that should just be paid for, was what people said. So that's central government, but our participants saw a big role for the community energy sector itself too to work better within and between each other, um, established organisations providing startups with finance and advice, which happens already, but uh, need for more of that, cooperating and kind of buying, <coughs> maybe buying solar panels together, clubbing together to invest in offshore wind or the like. Um, and they liked our idea of selling collectively to get a better power purchase agreement. And they could also get involved in developing the software which the new 
digital energy system or runoff, to go back to the previous slide, if, if they want government to keep that kind of market open for small players, then the community energy sector should also be prepared to try and get in there and, and make it its own. But it also means working outside the sector with, with the wider co-op and social enterprise and third sector to maximise the kind of social benefits and inclusion of their work to reach everybody. Uh, with local authorities, and you know, as we've heard in Oxford and around about, there are some great examples, but uh, participants were keen to do a lot more in many more places. And with, with SMEs, um, it, they saw s some of the smaller commercial energy players in some ways facing similar challenges in trying to thrive and grow in the UK's very large-scale energy system. They saw that the sector, the community energy sector, needs to convince government of the benefits of community energy. So the, the wider social and economic benefits we've heard about, the co-benefits, but also the benefits to the energy system itself. People felt that if the future system needs demand-side response, needs engaged citizens, then there's a role for community organisations for whom citizen engagement is their kind of bread and butter. And finally, they recognise that they're going to need new skills in data and software, network management. Uh, but I think, as someone said, it's going to be it's hard to learn, but then fits and renewables were a nightmare when we started. So we can do, there's a kind of can-do spirit about that. Who else to work with? There's, Partnerships, again, are were very much on the agenda at our workshops. So there was hope, I got a lot of hope about local authorities. I think that they would be brave and uh, take a lead in developing these new local energy economies, buying from community energy companies, setting targets for local businesses to buy local energy and encouraging partnerships, which, from what we heard this morning, certainly in some places sounds promising. In Scotland and Wales, a lot of uh, focus on devolved governments and the important role they could play in policy, setting local ownership targets, but also encouraging others, local authorities and so on, to take action. Well, on the private sector, partly kind of a wish that some of the bigger players, maybe system operators, would really value the contribution community energy could make to the energy system, but also a hope that innovative companies would kind of see buying community as a positive branding, like buying green, and that energy SMEs would make common cause with the community sector. So there was lots to say, and we could go on, but um, many unknowns and uncertainties too. Some three key ones, I think, that came out. Firstly, the, um, all these kind of new markets and activities that are coming. People wondered, when's it going to be safe for relatively small community energy companies to commit to a particular technology or a particular market? And on the other hand, conversely, for some, like EV charging, are they already too late to get up to speed and compete? Scaling up, they recognise that to get big and to become everywhere and to become part of the new normal, they need to gain market power, they need to grow and professionalise. But how to balance this with strong local relationships which generate the trust and responsiveness and engagement that's vital for community energy? And heat, which has been kind of conspicuously missing from from the future, people felt that they didn't think community-led heat networks were going to be a big part of the future. And there were kind of big decisions in the future of the heat network that needed government to take a lead. So moving, just to finish from my part, moving away from what participants said, some kind of direct reflections from us about how the process went. Uh, firstly, it kind of worked, which was nice. People were... There's a lot of enthusiasm for thinking big and long-term, um, and people responded to the, the challenge to do this um, and to get out of their day-to-day. Their -day. And we've got lots of great insights on the vision and different things that could happen and things which needed to change. What was harder was sequencing the pathways, I think, and all putting all the steps in, which I guess is kind of our job in analysis and research, and it's tough. Um, secondly... I guess, to date, to survive in the ever-changing energy system, community energies had to be very adaptable. And this was, we felt, maybe reflected in that while participants generally shared an ethos of pushing for more transparent and more local energy systems, they were not pushing for one particular path or, or you know, w fixed on one particular model. They were motivated by broad goals around climate change and, and energy democracy, I think would characterise them but quite, quite flexible about the particular path and model they took to, to realise this. So, to finish with our future, do, 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 you can, I can, I can add a lip. 
Yeah. Or you can, you can do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's super quick. Uh, yeah, so um, we're just about to submit a paper on the survey work, so hopefully that will be coming soon. Um, the case study work is ongoing at Strathclyde, um, and we're looking in particular at uh, co-benefits coming out of the discussions at the workshop um, and policy recommendations. Um, I think that's fine. And if you want to get in touch or chat more, then our contact details are there. Thanks. Again, any any quick reflections on that? No, fine. Okay, we'll move on to the last uh, presentation from Mags. Good idea. Uh, who is going to be talking to us about local energy business structures, prospects for reducing energy demand? So, see if you can pass the PowerPoint test. <laughs> I don't think it's you. <laughs> I've got faith. It's going to come. You've got faith. Good. Come on. Yay. Yay. That's what you would need is for you to come down the stairs and uh, then it works. <laughs> Great. Okay. So thanks, everybody. Um, I'm going to be presenting some initial preliminary work um, that we've been doing at Edinburgh University, myself um, and Jan Webb, who's also here, looking at um, different local energy business structures and opportunities um, that they're connected with for reducing energy demand or energy saving um, in buildings. Um, it's going to be a bit more high level than the other presentations at the moment, um, partly because this is work in progress, so I don't actually have the answers um, just yet, but I'm hoping you'll all help me with that. Um, so... The paper that this work is based on is um, examining um, different business structures for local energy saving. Um, we're looking particularly at business structures that are being put into use by local authorities um, and that local authorities are involved in and part of. Um, we're talking about business structures meaning something like the arrangement for managing a project. So what's its legal structure, what's the ownership form and what are the contractual relationships. So other people have talked about business models, delivery models, kind of let's just put those all in one bucket for the purposes of this, but I accept that there are differences and there is academic literature and debate about that, but I'm not going to go into that. Uh, we can perhaps talk about that later. Um, but really what we're interested in is saying, okay, so there are different uh, business structures that are being used by local authorities. What is the interaction between the business structure and energy saving in buildings? So I thought that was quite a straightforward question. Turns out it's not, or at least I'm finding that it's not. Um, but I suppose broadly it's trying to say, um, are the business structures that local authorities are using um, materially consequential to reducing energy demand in buildings? If so, how and on what basis and on what terms? Um, and what do the different delivery models open up or not um, for reducing energy demand in buildings? Um, so those are the kind of things I want you to think about whilst I go through um, the presentation, because I'm hoping you'll be able to perhaps give me some answers on those points. Um, and I think we've already talked quite a bit of today and this morning. It was really kind of neatly laid out about why we might be thinking about these um, points and these questions um, and the idea of local energy more broadly being something that people are interested in. Um, I was at, uh, I've been at a couple of events now where um, the Minister Claire Perry has said the future is local. Okay, so how and in what ways is that local? And the profits bring from the uh, energy revolution demonstrators, of course, are one um, set of examples that are trying to look, about, look at that. So, moving on rapidly. We are taking some existing data that we have that is based on a project um, that was supported both by UKIRK and as was the Energy Technologies Institute. We have 40 local authority case studies as our starting point, um, and we have used that um, data set to go, okay, 
which of these um, initiatives can we take forward and ask a question about energy saving and the relationship between the business structure and energy saving in buildings. So we've got a kind of new criteria. So we've not taken all of these projects because they didn't all fit. So we wanted to have projects um, that were focusing on buildings, um, a dimension of energy saving. So if it was just solar PV on a building and that was it, it doesn't count. Um, and where a decision on the um, business structure had already been made. So some of the case studies that we had um, were in very early stages. So I've, uh, we're sort of also in an updating phase where it's, well, has the decision been made and then can we include them and provisionally perhaps yes or no. So we've got about an initial set of 32 projects that met our criteria for inclusion um, and we'll, you know, think about extending that out um, going forwards and I'll perhaps come back to that at the end. So, what are the business structures in, our, in that starting data set that we've got? Um, what are the ones that are being used by local authorities? So, we've identified provisionally eight different structures. I was really worried that people weren't going to be able to see. This is a huge screen. Everyone can see. <laughs> Great. Um, so, some of these are obviously kind of entail a whole pile of different structures within them. So, community-owned social enterprise. Well, that could have a number of different legal forms. So I appreciate that this is quite high level, but for the purposes of right now, let's just go with that. Um, equally, a municipal district, ESCO, could have a number of different forms, but it is distinct from an in-house run project initiative and a private sector concession contract initiative. And that's the kind of key dimensions of this disaggregation at this kind of um, scale. Um, so the next thing we were saying was, OK, we can identify these different uh, business structures that are being used for projects that have a kind of greater or lesser uh, focus on energy saving in buildings. What are the different um, dimensions? How are they being used? Um, and what do these different structures enable or exclude or marginalise or open up? And, and perhaps in what, in what ways? So... Um, this is my first attempt um, at trying to look through that question. I only have one slide that looks like this, so don't worry. <laughs> don't be afraid. Um, it's first go at distilling a picture, very much work in progress. But the main point of this colour scheme is to say that there are differences. Um, so down here on the left are the different um, business or delivery structures um, that are being used. And on the top... What we've done is divided out um, building-led refurbishments, so fabric, um, new boilers, um, controls, that kind of thing, in domestic and non-domestic buildings. So that's the level of detail we've gone to with that. New infrastructure, so district heating networks, um, utilising waste heat, uh, thermal storage, so system efficiencies for reducing energy uh, and energy saving, uh, again, domestic and non-domestic, and then... <coughs> I put these on because I had them and then I couldn't decide whether to take them off or not. So we've still got advice and behaviour change and supply chain. So what I just want to spend the next few minutes doing is kind of, I suppose, talking through this in a little bit of detail. So the main points, if we perhaps look at an in-house delivery structure where the local authority has an in-house team, perhaps Bristol Energy's 40 members of staff, um, versus... Um, a local authority um, using an energy performance contract to improve the um, energy efficiency of buildings, you can see that in principle, and based on the cases that we've got, the in-house <coughs> delivery structure, in principle, gives opportunities to improve um, buildings across... Uh, the energy efficiency in buildings kind of across a broader range, whereas, by contrast, the energy performance contract is really specific. So it's really, in the way that it's been used in our, in the cases that we've got, it's being used for council-owned buildings, so the non-domestic buildings, um, and it's being used... Um, so it's not particularly opening up in, that, uh, in the domestic sector, though I suppose in principle, maybe... Anyway, let's not get into that. And, um, it, could, and it hasn't, to date, been used for um, system-type infrastructure, so district heating networks and so on. And um, I'm having a nodding head from over there, so I must be sort of on the right uh, track with the energy performance contracting. 
Um, so if we look at those two models, it looks like there are some quite clear differences potentially with what's being opened up. Obviously, an in-house model um, structure requires investment in a team, in capacity, in financing, in delivery, and all of that. But in principle, if you have those, it looks like it might offer more than the energy performance contract. Then looking at, say, for example, the joint venture where a local authority enters into a partnership with another organisation to develop. We only have one of these in our case study, so it's a bit hard to know in its very early days. But in principle, the goal of them setting up this joint venture was to get across some of the issues with the concession contract model where they found it really hard to extend, um, extend district heating networks to... Um, improve the fabric of buildings, particularly in social housing where they've been using uh, district heating networks together. And in principle, having a joint venture where there's a different decision-making structure embedded in the delivery structure, the idea is that that will help that process. So it's still working very much with a private sector partner and combining financing and so on, but is meant to shift the ability to open up different opportunities um, for buildings. So those are just a kind of couple of examples of where we're trying to think through where these um, distinctions might come in. Um, and in the interest of time, I'll just move on. So what are some emerging implications um, or thoughts or speculations about what kinds of um, findings we might try and derive from this data as the analysis continues? Well, it looks like perhaps... Um, I, well, there is a question about... Um, anyway, sorry, that's a separate thought. I've been on holiday, and I'm still half in holiday mode, and I've been telling everyone I've met today, oh, I've been having such a great holiday. It's really hard to get back into work mode. Um, but it looks like, at least, there is a disaggregation of opportunities, which is the main sort of thrust. So where do those come in? So possibly it looks like if you can... Uh, get the material together to have an in-house team, that that creates more opportunities than others, perhaps the energy performance contract, um, and that um, direct um, kind of focusing on the um, kind of on the buildings is perhaps, for example, something that's harder to achieve to the licensed energy supplier model. We've only got a couple in the UK that are local authority-led ones, and one of them is now doing a heat as a service pilot, which brings in actually a different question about that. So that will be some of the upgoing, uh, ongoing work is, does a local authority-owned municipal energy supplier actually, in a different way, does it open up um, heat as a service? Does that then mean that does address reducing energy demand in buildings? And does that kind of change the um, way we're thinking about the relationship between uh, business structures and um, how we might go about trying to generate change? Um, and I'm now over time. I'm thinking, oh, this is going to be so on time. Um, so I suppose there is, a, there is also a bigger question which I'm interested in, which I think at this conference is something that is, people agree that local does matter, but does local matter? What, how does local need to be thought about in relation to energy systems and change and ownership and the business structure? And how does that manifest and which bits of it are important and how can we embed those in the business structures? Um, if we're thinking radically about rapidly reducing um, energy demand in buildings, do we need, um, what approaches do we need, and would a centralised or more coordinated approach be more effective, or what do we need to enable local models to work? Um, and just, I suppose, to say the kind of ongoing work on this is to update and get more detail from our case studies about the energy saving activities that are being deployed under these different structures and to revise our provisional typology, because obviously there, as I mentioned, multiple forms of community models, multiple forms of ESCOs and that kind of thing, and so this perhaps doesn't have as much disaggregation as we want. That's it. Thank you very much. I'd just like to also recognise uh, my colleagues, Jan, who's here, uh, Dave, who was a key part of the initial project that our data is based on, and Dan Vanderhorst, who is going to be working in uh, some of this work going forwards. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Very interesting uh, presentation on the different potential models. Points of clarification? Points of clarification. Yeah. I forgot. There was a one that it was concession. Concession contract. What is that? 
So that is where a um, local authority enters into a long-term contract, typically possibly 25, maybe 40 years, maybe even longer, with a provider to develop usually a phase of a district energy network is the way it's been used. But you might have a concession contract for a waste incinerator or a waste provision. And so they enter into, agree to, fine, we will build this heat network, we will run it and operate it and own it for you and finance it for 25 years, and then the local authority can buy it back at the end of the concession. Yeah, a kind, kind of, an, yeah. Um, yeah. Any other? Could I ask the presenters to join me on the table here? I uh, think we'll agree that those have been four very stimulating um, presentations and discussions looking at a variety of different issues. I don't think we found the magic answer, like what is the uh, ideal business model, but um, never mind. I'm sure there's plenty more work to be done. Um, <clears throat> yep, that's fine. We've got about... Um, We've got about 20 minutes, roughly, um, for questions from you. So what I'd like to do is to take <coughs> questions in groups of about three. So if you could raise your hands when you're interested. And when you um, ask your question, if you could introduce yourselves so we know who's in the room and who your question is particularly directed at, that would be helpful. Okay, so first suite of questions. Yeah, Keith, this gentleman here. And the lady there, yeah. Yeah, thanks very much. I th um, so, uh, I was struck by some potential parallels between Max's talk and the first talk about the whole house and the energy sprawl and all that stuff. So, uh, I think one of the points from the first bit was you've got to think about the house and the system and choose the right options for that particular building. Uh, if it's an existing building or whatever, you're doing a new building. Think me also in terms of how to use local authority money to reach a certain comfort level, whether it's in domestic or non-domestic buildings, at kind of least overall cost in the medium term. Again, there's a need to think about all the options that are available and what are the right ones in the right context. So I wondered if uh, any of you got students working with local authorities, if there are uh, some of the models that the Max outlined, whether some of, whether some of them seem better suited to a proper evaluation of all the models than the others. Okay, I can hold that thought. Who's, is that particular, director particularly? Anyone who wants to have that. Okay, right, so if you can think about yourself who wants to answer that question. We've got a question at the front here. Oh, we've got a roving mic. How exciting. Uh, Nigel Hargreaves, Norwich Community Solar. Um, this is probably aimed uh, mainly at uh, Cathy and uh, her team on the pathways to thriving uh, community energy sector. Um, having a chat with Patrick Alcorn before this session uh, about got support from government, uh, he said that uh, quite often it's forthcoming when it's proven that a current target is not being met by the given business models trying to reach it. So what I was interested in in your presentation was have you thought about identifying where there may be targets that are set but the prevalent business models trying to achieve them are failing and what role therefore could there be for community energy to step in with an innovative approach? Okay, thank you. And the last lady, the lady with the hand there. <laughs> Maria Sharmina, Tyndall Center for Climate Change Research. Uh, so business models for local energy have the potential to generate quite a lot of local employment that will hopefully last as well and remain local. I wanted to hear the panel's thoughts on training people and retraining and how to facilitate that employment to make those business models viable. Thank you. Excellent. Right, so we've got questions on experience and opportunities for working with local authorities, which is Keith's point point here about when do these kind of business models kick in against the existing ones? What's the kind of point at which you come in? And then the point about opportunities from training. So who wants to have a go at any of those? I'm happy to take some of the first one. Go for it. Um, sort of what I took from your question is sort of are some business models more systemic than others? Yeah. 
something. Like, something. Yeah, I, th I think. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I, th I think the answer is probably yes. I think. Um, I think. Which ones are they? I think the the thing that I tried to come out from my presentation was that we historically have, particularly in buildings, focused on models and modelled performance and modelled outcomes. And I think models, that, um, business models that focus on outcomes and performance and, and broadening the net of what we include in those range of outcomes and not just carbon, but also other things that are important to people uh, and sort of front loading that into what the, the value proposition, as the jargon says, is I think is a, it will take us a long way to um, being more systemic, basically, rather than hoping that our model works. It's actually thinking about uh, what delivers in reality. And, and Keith, you had the point about the kind of local authority yeah, so input. Yeah, the, the business models that Max was kind of outlining there, is some of them take a more systemic approach than others. You know, yeah. and maybe that's a kind of a line of inquiry. Of, you know, a bit like, you know, like, like you said, Donald, was, was contract somebody to replace the windows. That might not be, it might be a good thing, but it might not be the best thing you could have done at that time. Simply a local authority strikes a contract for somebody to go in and do something, and that might not have been the best thing they could have done, or you know, a mixture of things. So any thoughts on working with local authorities or local authorities' ability to kind of get into this area? Yeah, Mike? Yeah, does, does this work? No? I think, just I think it. it does, but, but, I'll, but I'll just it does it anyway. work. Yeah, it does work. Okay, great. So, um, well, I suppose one thing to say is about <coughs> when it's actually about... Um, Using it for a specific project and deploying it, <coughs> it takes pretty much. It takes quite a long time to do anything, and so evaluating um, which type of business structure you would use for your project, at least in the case studies that we've looked at, um, there has been some kind of evaluation to go. What's the appropriate um, model for us? And that will that will depend on financing on what types of buildings are being addressed, for example. You know, if it's something that's just on the local authority's corporate estate, it, the evaluation may say, well, doing something like that in-house or using an energy performance contract is the most um, kind of useful thing we can do at the time because we've got X resources that we can commit and it's on our estate. And we either know a lot about it, so we can do it ourselves, or we don't know very much about it because we don't have an in-house expertise, so let's get a specialist to be involved. So there are just complex decisions that are going on that um, are about resources. It's about, um, do you have an energy management team? Do you actually know how many buildings you've got? Do you know what their leases are? That kind of, it, that kind of thing can be really hard to get. And I've um, interviewed people that we've interviewed in um, our work have it you know, expressed extreme frustration about the capacity issues in local <laughs> government. Um, but also that it can change over time. So a project might actually have a 10-year development timeline. Um, and I think that was actually reflected at an event in Leeds, the UK 100 event, when someone was talking about the heat network that's being built in Leeds, which was initially thought about 10 years ago and is being built now. Yep. And that that's being run as an in-house scheme. But there is potential that that could be sold, that could be... Um, turned into a different structure. So I suppose some of these are more permanent than others as yeah. well. And um, finally, and then I'll, sorry, hand it no, over. We'll the there audience. is also a, a point about perception of risk attached in general in local government and then attached to different business structures and familiarity with them and being able to go and see other schemes that have used that model and so on and so forth. And some structures are perceived to reduce risk in different ways, um, which we can talk about in the pub or whatever. Um, okay, good. Pick up on, uh, was, was that to claim that Carly no. and, yeah, about the, uh, when, when, when community business models. Think, is this one working? Yeah. It is. Um, yeah, good point. I mean, I think they were certainly uh, very aware that they needed to make the case for government and government wouldn't sort of act on, on just goodwill alone. Um, I mean, I guess, I don't know off the top of my head what the, the right target for them to hit would be. I mean, I know that devolved governments have targets about local ownership of, of energy or locally developed energy, um, which their community energy organisations in Wales and Scotland are definitely positioning themselves around. Um, looking nationally, I guess, because to date community energy, the amount of electricity generated is quite small in terms of energy system, so it's hard to say they're kind of a big chunk of meeting overall carbon reduction targets. Um, though that's, I guess, why they look at 
the other kinds of benefits they bring along with that. But thinking of the citizen engagement stuff, the smart meter rollout comes to mind and the kind of progress or lack of with that, <laughs> where, which came up a few times in our workshops as, you know, if you want to see what happens if you leave it to the big guys, this is what happens when they do citizen engagement. So we can do that better. We said that they, they don't want to be told to do the smart meter rollout in the next year either, probably. But, um, but they'll use that as an example of this is how the future energy system won't happen if you don't change tack and, and kind of work with people like us, I guess. Okay, and the point about training, you wanted to pick up that. Yeah, that's that. Can I say, actually, well, yeah, I was just saying that, yeah, that's, and I was, yeah, glad to hear Maria say that, because that came up certainly in our workshops as one of the things which they hoped, hope local authorities would pick up on, actually, that you could, you could do, you know, if you want local energy jobs, we'll happily provide apprenticeships and so on to, to get people involved in this. But, do you want to add anything to that, sir? Yeah. About, about training, about training, I think um, it's difficult when community energy project fails. So if one project fails because of lack of training, or the community could not um, run, the, run the business. And there's a lot of tension in terms of politics. So I think training is very important. And it's important that the community partner with experts so that they can learn. And one thing about training is that you're training young stars. So um, those young stars could go out to, with the knowledge they've gained, they could um, also develop new business models and the whole scheme could explode. So training is a very, um, uh, very important uh, part of it that could lead to some other benefits. Thank you. I have another round of questions. Ooh, look at that. Right, okay, we've got four men. <laughs> right, okay, well, we'll do it anyway. So the guy at front here and the gentleman there and then the two on that row there. If you could be brief with your questions. Hi, um, yeah, I'm John Taylor from the Greater Southeast Energy Hub. Um, I think Donald briefly mentioned green mortgages um, in his um, presentation. I think, um, yeah, some of the other presentations highlighted the high capital costs of this. Um, what's the role you're seeing for local finance in these business models as well? I, I, um, could we see the re-emergence of building societies and that sort of... Um, 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 hi, David Elms from Warwick Business School. Um, you often see business models crystallise into some sort of dominant model as profitability starts becoming clear in the same way you see in technologies. Um, so do you see the pathways yet for understanding what's likely to be the part that will drive these into profitability and therefore the business model will crystallize? Okay, and the last two there. These will have to be the... Uh, was, uh, are there any women who wanted to ask a question in the interests of some sort of gender balance? Okay, well, you have first... Not, you, you get first go at coffee. Uh, <laughs> right, the last two questions there. Yep, go for it. Yeah, so uh, James Dixon, University of Strathclyde. Um, my question is about, uh, there are some bits of the energy sphere, should we say, that business models, that I'm struggling to think of where business models can, can fit or what the right one might be. So to take uh, my own example, which would apply to millions of people, presumably, I'm a private renter of a squatty Glaswegian tenement flat. Um, so it makes no sense for me to retrofit any kind of efficiency stuff. The landlord doesn't care because he doesn't pay the energy bills. He can charge whatever rent he wants. Um, so, who, who is the person to which that business model is addressed? Who's making the profit? Where's the incentive? Good one. Good one. Last, last question here. Thanks. <clears throat> Trent Berry from uh, Vancouver, British Columbia. Um, so, like, the missing link here for me is uh, business mo targets don't create a business. Um, business model doesn't create a business. Policy does. Um, and so I, I'll ask this in the context of the energy sprung um, example. So we talked this morning about carbon being the real big issue. Carbon efficiency is not the same as energy efficiency. So in your model, have you looked at examples of carbon performance targets? Um, and then I guess the next big question is, how do you monetize that? Uh, and I'm curious the experience in the UK. You use the example of other values to people but carbon isn't a value. I mean, it's the same energy at the end of the day. So how do we crystallize that in, uh, in the business model? Okay, great. So four inches. So we've got mortgages and local finance, the holy grail of business models. How do we sort out the <coughs> private rented sector in particular? And how do we monetize the benefits? Uh, who wants to have a go at those? 
walked in local I've finance. I've got some, something to say on that, but yeah. I don't want to be... You, start, you, there, you wanted to go? Yeah, yeah. should yeah. go in a line? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, um, yeah, interesting point about where have you... Where's he gone? <laughs> Has he moved? Oh, there he is, sorry. Um, <laughs> Sorry, John. Yeah, so, so green mortgages, yeah, I think really important point. I th uh, in a partner piece of work uh, I've done on energy efficiency finance, clearly a key thing is, is the cost of capital, um, mainly in terms of just driving the fundamental economics of energy efficiency and retrofit and, and all these sorts of things. Is, you know, if you're talking about 25-year paybacks, clearly the interest rate of over 10% is going to be a monstrous uh, you know, kind of burden on the project, and that was obviously seen in the Green Deal. So some people are talking about green mortgages. I think that's a very sensible solution, perhaps, for um, the private, you know, uh, private homeowners, people who can increase borrowing or, you know, maybe doing other kinds of renovation. But also, you know, your point about um, building societies or, um, or even, you know, community financing, potentially. Uh, I think it's a horses for courses thing, personally, until we, unless we have some kind of big uh, move from government for a state investment bank uh, or something, you know, offering zero interest loans. Um, I think that it will be a patchwork. Um, I think that f to focus on finance for me is always slightly to put the cart before the horse because until you have projects that are viable, that are financeable, the money can't do anything on its own. Um, and I think perhaps that relates to the other point about the Holy Grail. Uh, you know, I think that, you know, um, the, the money will come once the business model is, is in place, I think. Um, to focus on the money is probably the wrong focus, in my view. Do you just want to pick up the issue about monetising the benefits, because that was specific in relation to the energy uh, I don't think you have to monetise them. People do not do up their kitchen because of some cost-benefit analysis. People do not paint their house or change their, you know, wallpaper for those reasons. So I think you have to be tapping into something which is much more emotional, is much more people's attachment to place, uh, and it's about, you know, doing something that they want to have done rather than, uh, you know... So, I, I, yeah, I'm not... Obviously, carbon is the goal, but um, I think that that's not the conversation we should be having with your man and woman on the street, actually. I think it should be about home improvement um, and, and what the benefits of that are. OK. So, so I think... I mean, I, I totally agree with that in terms of when you're selling it to uh, consumers or home owners or renters or whatever... That, that that's usually important. I suppose the other side of it is that for the business model to work and it to be it, it to be something that can be financed, then that element does have to work. But perhaps mm. we've got it the wrong way around of kind of selling that as the major benefit in the past. And I thought your framing of that was really good. Um, in terms of as a private renter, and I'm sure you're very lovely flat in Glasgow. Um, <laughs> Other people might have ideas about how you could split that up and share and, you know, you could still monetise it. I think I would probably say that there's also some things that we don't have to create a business model for in a, in a free market. Actually, maybe in that case, it's about standards for landlords and property and just raising it. Um, and it's not about trying to encourage people through a financial benefit. It's just saying you actually can't let your house if out, or your flat out if you don't, if you don't improve it. Um, and in terms of the, the crystallising of the, you know, the ultimate business model, I suppose just from a community energy sector point of view, um, the thing that we found particularly interesting about the workshops was how flexible the people were about which business model they went for because they were kind of driven by something else. And so actually the sort of context of policy creates the drive um, was definitely true in those conversations. It wasn't about, um, you know, I must install a heat network before I die and I'll just do it in, under any circumstances. It's like, well, how, how as a community group would we respond to the incentives that are there? But also, how can we try and drive policy by demonstrating the evidence and our capability to deliver against, you know, different, uh, different targets and goals that, that we might have, particularly if we're talking about targets that are, you know, more, more and more urgent, more near term, more challenging in terms of how we might meet them. We've talked a lot today about looking at co-benefits. So then I think that that, you know, that, that particularly is somewhere where community energy could, could contribute against those different co-benefits, not just carbon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, anything you wanted to pick up on? Sorry? Yeah. We're, um, we're into coffee time now, okay, so. <laughs> yeah. Concerning the one for uh, landlords, um, I think uh, we need to look at 
how we try uh, cannot solve all the problems. So for, for tenants, uh, you can't expect that uh, they'll, be able, they'll be the one retrofitting their homes or they'll be the one replacing the properties. So and how we try is, uh, is just maybe for um, targeted homes, the ones that are really poor in terms of energy performance. So I think we need to develop business models that would uh, make it profitable for landlords to kind of um, do this uh, do these replacements and maybe they see the benefits or the profit of doing this. And one of the uh, key parts of my research is to see uh, how landlords could form corporations in, in terms of uh, maybe partnering with experts and then they deliver the services uh, in their, or they deliver this uh, retrofitting or these replacements in these landlords' homes and then offer the services to, to their tenants. So um, there's hope that such kind of scheme could uh, come up uh, very, very prevalent. Also, uh, if you look at places with that which are currently in Northern Ireland, and, uh, there's no uh, main driver, and if if uh, that child doesn't come soon, you expect homes to also be in, in full poverty. Also, about the path to profit uh, to profit for business models. Um, still, I think um, heat as a service is is, is will be what I would, I would suggest because. Um, Heat as a service allows the expert to run the business because if if you leave if you leave the business in terms of the um, in the tenant's hand, they could because of the way they operate it, they could be at loss. But if the experts are running these heating services, they could take advantage of demand response, take advantage of different feasibility values, and aggregate these these different value streams, and they make it more profitable. So I think if you put it in the, in the hands of the expert, it could create additional benefits, and those benefits could now be reflected in terms of reducing the utility bills for the tenants or for people using this, using them. Yeah. Sort of uh, revenue quick, stacking, isn't it? I'm going to quickly yeah. say on the subject to lo local finance, just go and hear Maria and colleagues talk tomorrow when there are results on our, our survey oh, about that. But, um, Free advert. Okay. <laughs> Last yeah, word. Mine's about the same, but it's to say <laughs> yeah. that... Um, there is a role, I think, for looking at um, how state investment has been used in other contexts um, and in other countries and has been a key part of rolling out um, some of these measures elsewhere and we could learn from that. Um, and just in terms of your cold, leaky Glasgow flat, I would also say go to Faye Wade's talk, who will be discussing Energy Efficient Scotland, which is trying, which is a programme that is aiming to address every single building yeah. in Scotland, so including... Yes. Um, private okay. renters and having a model in Scotland over a 20 year plan that will do that. But I don't know anything else about it, but Faye does. <laughs> so right. talk to her. Thank you very much. Can I ask you all to thank our, uh, our presenters, please? <laughs>